this will give a high level overview of the case management forms in the GBV IMS Plus. Let's start by thinking about why we document case management in the first place. What's the point of documenting our services? We document cases for many reasons. First, we recognize that you see many survivors and it's not natural to remember everything that happened to someone. It's why doctors keep notes and also therapists. We have to be able to stay up to date on our cases and that means having the ability to jog your memory and avoid asking repeat questions. Maybe, for example, a survivor said she has legal needs but doesn't want to pursue them at the point of intake. With documentation, you can come back to that topic later when and if she's ready and having notes will help you do that. The second reason is to ensure continuity of services. If you go on leave as a caseworker, you're sick, or you leave the organization, another caseworker needs to be able to understand what's going on with a survivor to continue the services. The third reason is to see progress. The survivor is an instrumental part of the case management process. If you're working with her over a long period of time, your case file can act as a record of progress for which you can look back and see a record of change. Next, case files are another way for us to look at quality of care. A supervisor can learn a lot about services being provided and the quality of them by reviewing a case file. And finally, the lesser reason is for analysis. By looking at this data, we can determine what's working, what's not, who's accessing services, and who's being left out. With this background information, now we'll look at the nine core case management forms in the system. We'll look at what step they're associated with, who should complete them, and the overall purpose of the form. Let's start with a consent form. Consent happens continually throughout the process of case management, but we get consent for services, that is consent to engage in the case management process, prior to disclosure. The other type of consent is for referrals or anonymized trend sharing. There are two points where we collect consent. First, at the start of case management services, again, before the survivor starts telling her story, the point of consent at this point is to document their permission to participate in the case management process. In this, they provide their permission for the caseworker to collect and store information about their case throughout the case management process. The other formal point when we collect consent is during the case management process. For this, we use a separate consent form. And here we can document if the survivor provides permission to share information with other service providers in the context of a specific available referral. This form also allows us to document their permission to share non-identifying data for the purpose of trend sharing. This form should be completed by the assigned caseworker to the case together with the survivor or the caregiver or guardian in the case of children. The purpose is to record the survivor's permission to participate in the case management process, to collect and store information about their case, and to share information with other service providers or for reporting purposes, if they consented to that. The next form is survivor information. This is where we document demographic details about a client. It's collected after the consent or assent process has been obtained for services, and it's collected by the assigned caseworker. Next, we have survivor assessment. The assessment form is a crucial part of the case management process. This is how we understand the presenting issue and the compounding factors. After the welcome and introduction step, we assess the psychosocial, medical, safety, and legal needs of the survivor linked to the violence she has experienced. This is done by the assigned caseworker. The point of this is to record information gathered on the case regarding both risks and needs, as well as strengths and resources. The information recorded in this form will be analyzed and used as a base for developing the case plan. Then we have the case plan. The case planning process starts after assessment. This is the third step of the case management process. The reason for this is that we have to know where we are first before we can plan where we want to be. So this follows the assessment period. This is performed by the assigned caseworker 
And the point of this is to document the needs, goals, services, and referrals, the ways we are supporting the survivor's well-being and recovery. Then we have the safety plan. This is part of step three, case action planning. It comes after assessment when safety concerns are identified. The planning process is conducted by the assigned caseworker. The purpose is to have documentation of the risks and plans to mitigate those risks for survivors living in a dangerous environment. It's particularly relevant for survivors of intimate partner violence. Not all survivors will require a safety plan. It's important to note the plan should be developed in conjunction with the survivor who best knows her route to safety. Next, we have the referral form. This is filled out by the caseworker during or following the case planning. It can also be performed in follow-up sessions where there is a need to refer a survivor for another service or services. Documenting this allows us to share essential information to another provider to ease the service delivery and avoid the survivor having to repeat her story. Then we have the follow-up form. This is completed whenever a follow-up session is conducted at any point during the case management process, from the opening of the case until case closure. The frequency of follow-ups should be linked to the survivor's need and risk levels, but can also vary greatly depending on the setting where you're working. In some places, there are no follow-ups, and in some places, there are many follow-ups. This too is done by the caseworker. The point of this form is to document the follow-up actions and confirm that specific actions have been taken and services are provided, or to identify and address barriers in accessing services. Ultimately, it allows us to monitor the survivor situation. This form tracks progress made toward goals set in the initial action plan. The case closure form is completed when the closure criteria are met and in discussion with the survivor when possible. This is done by the caseworker and depending on the context may be subject to approval by a supervisor. Case closure documentation helps us have a record of the reasons for closure and to ensure that essential messages are passed on to the survivor. Finally, we have the client feedback form, sometimes called client satisfaction. This form should be completed at the end of the case management process or in your setting if you have a different time period, whichever one is shortest. This is done by the supervisor of the caseworker or another caseworker or staff member who has been trained on how to do client feedback. The point of this is to document levels of satisfaction around quality of care, access, reception, confidentiality, and overall services. These forms are the core case management forms in the GBVIMS Plus. For more information on the forms or to learn how to navigate them, visit gbvims.com for videos that walk you through each case management form.